It's time to adjust your headsets and your seats and get ready to listen to a great piece of football archaeology history as Timothy P. Brown of that website comes on to tell us about a famous ill-fated trip west from yesteryear of the gridiron. Tim's coming up in just a moment to share this great story. This is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history on a day-to-day basis. Your host, Darren Hayes, is podcasting from America's North Shore to bring you the memories of the gridiron one day at a time. So as we come out of the tunnel of the Sports History Network, let's take the field and go no huddle through the portal of positive gridiron history with pigskindispatch.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of pigskindispatch.com. Welcome once again to the Pig Pen, your portal to positive football history. And welcome to another Tuesday where we get to visit with our friend Timothy P. Brown of footballarchaeology.com to talk about one of his famous tidbits he has. Tim, welcome back to the Pig Pen. Darren, good to see and hear from you on the new year. Looking forward to a great 2024. Yeah, me too. It definitely is a new year and Boy, we're uh, coming out swinging tonight uh, with talking about this great subject matter you have from a hundred and almost 120 years ago with a very famous team at a very famous uh, time in football history. Uh, you have it titled, uh, your tidbit from back in July of uh, this past year, 2023, St. Louis Jews Ill-Fated Trip West. So what can you tell us about yeah. St. Louis U and uh, their ill-fated trip? Yeah, so... You know, I think one of the things that uh, I'm always intrigued by stories of teams that have since dropped football or de-emphasized football. And part of what I enjoy about all kinds of history, doesn't matter what the what the subject matter is, is the kind of the what if things had been turned out differently? What if they'd gone left instead of right? I mean, there's just so many, so many things in history where things could have gone differently. And so, I, you know, I just find that when a school drops the ball it's like well what if they'd done something what if they'd kept it you know what would the world look like now um so you know st louis you most people don't associate with football but especially right after the introduction of the forward pass they were one of the top teams in the country um they were the first team to throw a forward pass in a reg- you know regular season game um and that in 1906, they went 11-0. and They had a, a guy named Eddie Kokums coaching them. Um, he had he played at Wisconsin, and he ended up down at St. Louis U. Um, and he just kind of was just ahead of everybody else in terms of thinking about the forward pass. And then he also had a guy named Bradbury Robinson, who so happened – to have learned how to throw an overhand spiral while he while he was playing at Wisconsin, and then he transferred down to St. Louis U. And so, um, so St. Louis U creates this offense, and th- this is just you know one of one of these things. It's just like okay, if they first did, when they first introduced forward pass, how do you throw the damn ball, and what what do pass patterns look like, and what does pass protection look like? It's all all that had to be invented, and so. You know, he was like way ahead of his time, but their their fundamental route was to send four guys out and they ran button hooks. And when the quarterback was ready to throw the ball, he would yell hike and everybody would turn around for the button hook and the ball would be coming to one of them. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, somehow that, you know, they, that was like their bait. That was their core pattern. And they ran it over and over again. Um, and, you know, they were successful. They went 11-0. and 0. And they, I mean, they they beat a lot of really good teams. Um, and, you know, so, but they were out there in St. Louis. And so, you know, the all you snobby people out east like you, you know, weren't <laughs> paying attention to what was happening out in the, out in the great Midwest. So, anyways, um, so then 1907 comes around. And despite the success that they had, um, they only had like 16 players on the team. 
And at times, due to injuries and other factors, they, they'd only have like 13 guys show up for practice. So they couldn't even scrimmage. Um, and the other weird thing is that uh, almost all the players on the team were in med. So I'm, I'm not sure back then, you know, back then med school and law school were sometimes undergrad and dental school, same thing. A lot of times they were undergrad. So I'm not sure. It just dealt with uh, leeches and uh, bloodletting probably yeah. at that point. In time. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so. But, you know, you need that. <laughs> you need that alternative medicine. <laughs> so, so, uh, so anyways, I mean, it's just, just an unusual roster and situation, but they still were, were really good. They, you know, their first five opponents, they blow out what's now Missouri S and T Southeast Missouri state, Arkansas, Creighton and Wash U. So then they go to Wabash who at the time that was a really good team. And St. Louis, U was down a couple of guys and they end up losing um, like uh, 11 to 12. And then the next two weeks beat, they beat out, they beat uh, Kansas 17, nothing, then Nebraska 34, nothing, you know, so they end up finishing uh, seven and one and they put away their pads and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, the season's over, except then they, that's kind of announced that they're going to be heading out West for a couple of games uh, over the you know Christmas break. So, and, you know, at the time, no one did that. Um, they were the fifth team to ever play, to ever cross the Rockies to play a football game. Because uh, Chicago did it in 18, 1894. Carlisle did it twice. And then Michigan went to Pasadena to play the first Rose Bowl in 1902. So here it's 1907. They're the fifth one to cross the mountains. So they go and they go to play Washington State. And I would just say, you know, since you're a former football official, um, you know, it, it sounds from the newspaper reports like the officials weren't all that impartial uh, in some of their calls for the game. At least that was the St. Louis U perspective. But so they ended up losing the game. And then um, – then two, uh, then that was Christmas Day, and then New Year's Day they play a team called Multnomah um, Athletic Club, which was through World War One. They were one of the top teams on the West Coast. They just they had a lot of former college, you know, football players. Uh, they had a great stadium. Oregon, Oregon State used to play at Multnomah Stadium well into the 1950s, maybe later than that. Um, oh, sounds like, you know, St. Louis, you kind of disagreed with some of the officiating that game too, and they lose 11 to six. So here they went all that way, you know, a couple thousand miles across the country, uh, took them days to get there and days to get back. And they end up, you know, losing two games, but, you know, great life experience for all the players and all that kind of stuff. So, but it's, you know, so that's just one of those things where, you know, you think about Right after you know, Ford Pass is invented or or made legal. Um, St. Louis used one of the top teams, certainly in the Midwest, if not the country. And then you know, Kokum stays on to coach one more year, and then he leaves and basically you know, leaves football for the most part. Um, and you know, St. Louis, you basically never achieved the same level of of greatness. I think they dropped football in like 1949, something like that. So I know I wrote this in a different tidbit, but one other, what might've been kind of story about them was that in 1914, a new graduate from Notre Dame, a guy named Rockney was planning to go to medical school at St. Louis U and he wanted to help coach football. And the medical people said, no, you can't do that. If you're going to be in med school, you're going to be in med school. If you want to coach, you can coach, but you can't do both. So Rockney ends up staying at Notre Dame. And then, you know, we know what happens there. But, you know, you just think about that. Had Rockney gone to medical school, maybe he just becomes a physician and we never hear the guy's name again. Maybe he coaches and, you know, has similar success. I mean, you got to believe he would have had success at St. Louis U, maybe not to the same level, but 
very similar kinds of schools at the time. So, you know, maybe today we'd be cheering on the St. Louis Ubilicans in major bowl games instead of the Fighting Irish. But you the, know, the four might have been the St. Louis U. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you know, I, I live for I live for in St. Louis for 14 years, so I'm very familiar with the city. But um, yeah, it ended. St. Louis really became the prominent soccer, you know, hotbed in in the, in the states for decades and decades. Uh, both St. Louis and Washu were big time soccer programs, you know, and there just was never the same. You know, now like Lindenwood is a D1 program, but you know until just the last two, three years, they didn't have D1 football in a city of that size. So, And, and they don't have professional football anymore either. So, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not sure they ever did. But... <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they were but in a Super this... Bowl with the, the Rams when the Rams were there. The Cardinals yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I, I was thinking more of the St. Louis football Cardinals. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so... I went to a few of those games. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet. I'll bet. <laughs> well, hey, that, that's a great story and, uh, you know, on a great program that uh, love rekindling these programs from yesterday, just like you said earlier, and, uh, you know, bringing yeah. some remembrance to them and, uh, you know, sharing these memories of them. So really appreciate you doing that, Tim. And you have these tidbits that are coming out, uh, you know, every night. And uh, you know, maybe you could share with the audience how they, too, can partake in these. Yeah, uh, real simple. Best thing is just go to the site, footballarchaeology.com, subscribe. You can subscribe for free, and then uh, you get access to whatever's there. I also um, I also, you know, post post everything on threads and on Twitter, uh, both under the Football Archaeology name. All right. Timothy P. Brown, footballarchaeology.com. We thank you once again for sharing this great story from Football of Antiquity, and we will talk to you again next week. Very good. Thank you, sir. Peeking up at the clock, the time's running down. We're going to go into victory formation, take a knee, and let this baby run out. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back tomorrow for the next podcast. We invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleet Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. Special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. 